welcome everyone now the time has come to start our event so let's get started the first technical session of this ftp is on the topic secure and private machine learning i'd like to request to introduce you all with a first speaker for the day professor subhankar mitra so from department of computer science nice bhuvneshwar he has been dedicatedly working as trader f in school of computer science at nice bhuvneshwar in 2020 prior to nice he served as an assistant professor in the department of computer science and engineering iit rushi and research associate at oak ridge national lab he had studied at famous institutions like university of florida nit raukela and so on if you all remember he was with us during the last ftp held last year in our college on the topic men have impacted us in so many ways we are really honored to have him again with us in this year's ftp so without any delay i'd like to request him to shed some light on this topic secure and private machine learning over to you sir Thank you, Shubhashini. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thanks. Yes, sir. Give me like one moment. Share this. Okay. Uh, screen is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. Singh. Uh, so this is, I think this goes for like five days. Uh, uh, so which is just confirming? Uh, you are recording, yes. फाइव and i'm assuming most of you are like either students or faculties uh, who have a tiny bit of interest in machine learning at least to start with and then um, fortunately or unfortunately your first topic of uh, the entire uh, course is the secure and private machine learning uh, so in this uh, even though i knew this was the first topic i have not added much into the machine learning per se uh, So, if you have any questions on there, please feel free to interrupt me. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll be able to tell uh, or like clear if there are some doubts there. Okay. So, we'll start with something like uh, assuming that the machine learning standards are already there. Uh, so, we'll try to start with something like a secure and privacy and uh, how to like why it is important in machine learning and then. We'll start with one of the big topics uh, that is currently being involved in this particular field, uh, and then we'll cover one more topic. So there are two topics. We'll try to cover them one by one. Uh, so normally, when things started, like as in just not machine learning per se, like everything in recent few years, specifically, uh, there was a concept that floated around, like around maybe. It has been a long time, but like at least five years, people have talked about it. The concept is basically privacy by design, uh, security or privacy by design, per se. Uh, so, given like uh, as in any new uh, any new topic that comes up in the like future, for example, any new networking protocols that come into picture, so they normally start with nowadays they have to start with something called like a privacy by design. Uh, or secure by design or privacy by design. So, like the individual data has to be protected. Uh, but like machine learning started way before that. Yes, uh, like as in it's a very old topic. Uh, it came into it became popular in like let's say nineties and two thousands and the last decade. Uh, last year, basically exploded, of course. Uh, uh, 
but like uh, machine learning as a topic is pretty old yeah? uh, some of the topics in itself in machine learning are new they are getting more developed also uh, but like machine learning itself is pretty old so uh, the reason for saying that thing is like uh, when machine learning started like privacy wasn't a concern directly uh, and even when we knew like the uh, privacy is a concern or privacy is not a concern uh, so we did not care because the machine learning were not that good right so it's like algorithm the initial algorithms were not that good to do what we wanted uh, even before neural networks and deep neural networks that said they came in, like uh, you do not have like uh, you could not ask questions on abstract data, data types also given that uh, so because ml was old so and we did not care about the privacy by design not care about let's say we did not go through the process of privacy by design we uh, machine learning started with basically non secure and non private okay. let's say uh, the reason being like uh, what we have the current phase of entanglement so like big data of course the term you have heard so as in uh, the argument is basically a lot of data is collected uh, some data is required of course some data is required some data is not required but a lot of data is collected regardless yes now uh, this uh, video also it will be put on youtube so like still a lot of data is collected uh, how i speak uh, my mannerisms if it goes to youtube like that data is stored like forever yes and if somebody wants to replicate how i speak and uh, all that stuff uh, where do i pause and where do i fumble and all those stuff can be like some if somebody wants to analyze once it goes into youtube it just stays yes uh, so we have to be very careful on what goes of course uh, but the idea is a lot of data is collected regardless of where you go and what you do uh, cctv cameras and all that stuff of course they record it and the biggest i think uh, the problem per se but the biggest uh, stakeholder in this one uh, like the companies and the government itself uh, so the companies like amazon facebook apple and google of course these are the four big companies and there are others also like microsoft also and they collect like huge amount of data of course yeah uh, amazon uh, i think anywhere you shop amazon analytics run anywhere you google sometimes it feels very creepy when whatever you search on google will comes in amazon suggestions so yeah. uh, similarly facebook a lot of plugins run a lot of api in google facebook ads processing and similarly apple also does collect data like i think recently a few uh, one year back uh, like apple is known has been advertising itself as private privacy like featured company but apple also collects a lot of data so one year back i think Uh, i'm not sure if a lot of people okay so whoever uses uh, uh, like any apple product so there is a something called like a siri google uh, siri audio recordings yeah? uh, so uh, apple previously did not disclose that the previously collected like the whatever you speak to siri was actually collected in the cloud and there were a real person that will listening to you what you're telling and uh, of course like uh, the but this was not disclosed so we'll come back to why privacy is like, disclosed and so this was not disclosed to the people so it's definitely like against the privacy uh, the reason being say, like uh, even if apple collected this one the it's like similarly google also collects a lot of okay google whatever you using its collects okay. uh, google collects a lot more data than we can imagine of course yes. for example you google map on the traffic of course a lot of data is collected on your speed movement of your car and then it tries to predict the traffic pattern if it is red or green yeah? uh, uh, but the reason all this are basically if you see in the google uh, like all the traffic patterns let's say the red and the green even the data is collected it's like the, that is a data that has to be collected for google maps to be used for this but uh, we we actually like need google to not need google to take the data but we the google actually needs the data to collect like collect all the data and to give us back like if it's there's a traffic jam or something okay? uh, so this is very important right uh, so for a product to work and for a product to love okay, this is very important uh, similarly apple like uh, apple needs all those recordings let's say to run whatever algorithms they have 
सो दैट दे कैन लाइक लिसन टू अस बेटर मतलब दे कैन रिस्पॉन्ड टू अस बेटर व्हेन वी से हे सीरी Yeah, similarly, a lot of other things like Facebook. Uh, okay, so Facebook they have a lot of uh, privacy issues, but the, like one thing it does is basically, for example, it tries to. That's what the pitch has been that it supports local businesses. So in Facebook, you receive a lot of local ads of uh, businesses that are running. Uh, so like Facebook, that's why Champions itself has that. And the other thing is Amazon. Uh, so Amazon also Champions itself in uh, promoting like the. Uh, small businesses and small startups yeah if you see in amazon like as in the marketplace there will be a lot of businesses that have opened their own products and then have been highlighted and then people buy from them without amazon it would have been very difficult yes uh, so knowing what you like and then suggesting what you back is very important stuff it's a, it's a very important thing of the product so we need all of those so amazon facebook apple and google like they need all that we need a product that can do it for us so data collection is required what i'm saying uh, then also there is a dominant uh, of course like uh, let's say cctv cameras around uh, you know our aadhar card and uh, for example aadhar is linked with your vaccines or not uh, so similarly a lot of data is collected so uh, for example you have taken vaccine or not uh, it's it's a, a government has to collect the data to see if like we have achieved like good number of vaccinations or not Uh, because one way of vaccination, like just buying the vaccines and keeping it in, like in the, how do I say, in the like medical centers, and then telling that the people have been vaccinated is not the correct way. So, like, have people actually certifying that okay, I am vaccinated? That is much more helpful for the government to you know. And similarly, many others, like CCTV cameras at the airport and all that stuff. Uh, given like all these cameras are there, like, it's hard. It's, to find out who are the traffic violators is to find out people who are suspicious in airports and the railway stations and all the uh, let's say your bag disappear somebody who has stolen it's easy to get through so these are some parts that we absolutely need uh, nowadays at least um, so and all these data actually help us to achieve that uh, collection of data is not bad in reality uh, the point is we need that data to work okay? Uh, because if everybody says, for example, in Google Maps, that nobody wants to share the data with the Google, Google won't be able to tell you that there's a traffic jam. Uh, so these are important. Uh, the problem is not there, but the, the the data being collected is not an issue. Problem comes when it's not exactly a problem, but uh, responsibility comes when the data collected is highly personal and sensitive. Uh, so. When the data is highly personal, for example, browsing history, purchase history, speech, geolocation, my health, uh, so these become very, very personal. Yes, uh, somebody can track you down wherever you are going. So, for example, even if you, let's say you lied uh, with something like, but this is like a very personal time, right? It's a very personal time. So, let's say twelve to one is the lunch time, and you took that time to go do something. But like, if somebody keeps a track on you, then they know, okay, you went to this place, you went to that place, and so. On. It will be very hard to give interviews at other places. Okay. Uh, any questions? Sasmita has a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so given. Uh, Sorry. This is my mic. Question. So let me see. Uh, okay, Lena is the is the voice. Okay, now. Okay, okay, my bad. Okay, okay. Uh, so the next one is the risk of exposure. Okay. Uh, so once we have this data collected, uh, uh, is that fine now, Shubhendra? Because I Doctor Joshi, is that fine? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, let me know. You can ping me so that I can. Okay. okay. Uh, once you have uh, all this data collected, the problem is once it gets exposed. Yeah. Uh, so, because once you're blipping, or if you cannot hear, okay. 
Uh, so for example, if your credentials get stored, why is there like the credit cards and the passwords? So somebody can steal your personal property, yes. Uh, so they can steal your money, your passwords to your home, they can come in and then ping on the, uh, give the passwords to the house and then enter and then take away it. Yeah. You are sure because like there will be somebody to protect you off, but like if there is an exposure, there is an exposure, yes. Uh, the next thing is basically the identification, of course, your name, Name is still a very pretty known, but name in a particular organization that matters, right? And then biometric data, uh, of course, uh, these are very sensitive data, and somebody could also like do the identity theft, and that is very serious. Yes, you can. Okay, uh, Dr. Sunita, can you hear me or no? Still no. Okay, now it's fine. Okay. Uh, so the other thing was the uh, okay. So other thing was the information about you. So for example, the medical status. Uh, given what the medical status is, you might face discrimination. Right? Uh, let's say. What, let's say like I have something like. Uh, a very, uh, uh, let's say, a disease which basically would lead to like very high insurance cost, and then uh, my company, who are where I want to join, might might see that information even if I do not dis want to dis do not disclose. It, but there's an exposure, and the company might see, okay, you are a liability to the company. Like, why should I hire you? So there will be a discrimination against you. And similarly, there are other discriminations like if you have like a very strong political opinion, opinion, then of course you could be facing a discrimination on this. And you could also be like harassment. Yeah? When we have seen all this through, like I think a lot of years of like Twitter and Facebook, there is a lot of this happening. Yeah. Uh, it's still not audible. Uh, if yeah, actually, I'm on mic, so I'm not able to increase my volume. Okay, got it. Yeah, I'm assuming I'll try to be a little bit more loud. Uh, like, keep pinging if it's, yeah. Okay. Uh, so then what do we do? Uh, so we have the data. We understand the data is important because of the products that we love and like. Uh, the Few of the problems are it is highly personal sensitive, and exposure to them can lead to very strong uh, like threats. Okay? Uh, so what do we do? Uh, so specifically, uh, we try we targeting privacy of this. Okay? So privacy basically means like your right to your own information. Okay? Uh, it's rather than like a, a security person, the privacy means like. For example, how my data is handled. So, for example, if I give you my data, how will you handle it? What are you going to do with it? Where are you going to store it? All these questions of how to be, how, what are you doing, and how are you doing with my data will be like a privacy thing. Uh, so, if we increase privacy, so let's say there is a, a company, and then I ask them, okay, so I will give you my data, but you are not able to use it. Uh, so that goes against, right? Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Shivapratas, you cannot, uh, can anybody else confirm if you can see the screen? Yes, sir, the screen is clearly visible, sir. Okay, so that's super good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so once we have uh, the risk of exposure, so the next thing is I told you the right to your information. So you decide on what and how and where the data should be, like, stored and used. That specifically term is called privacy. Uh, if we say that, okay, you are not allowed to use my data at all. So if I do not give you the data, I do not, then the point is like the stuff like Google Maps and all those stuff might not work because they will miss the access to your geolocation. Uh, so that's why it's like the other places, the utility of the product that uses the data might reduce and most likely it will reduce. So the increased privacy, basically, as as an arm where we increase privacy, it affects utility. I'm not saying it is going to be linearly proportional or like exponentially proportional to that utility, but it affects utility in some degree. Uh, every time we hide our geolocation, it 
for example i think you have recently seen android 12 and i was 14 already had like the precise location and the precise location is off uh, so precise location basically points you where you are and the approximate location will give you like a area of like let's say one kilometer around your location uh, so, so for some reasons, your approximate location works fine. That does not distribute utility. For example, if the government wants to know in this particular place, uh, let's say in like what, in uh, between another area, how many people have been vaccinated. So you can put yourself in approximate location. Yeah. Government will still be able to know how many number of people okay, have taken vaccination in that area. Uh, but for example, in Google Maps, if you turn around, then it does not know where to pick you up from. Yeah? For example, in Oda Nuka, they don't know where to. Approximate location does not matter. I'm in Bijuina area. What does that mean? So, depending on the application, your increased privacy will affect your utility. Uh, so, the idea is to not remove the utility at all because otherwise the product is useless. So, the goal of the entire this particular field of like a secure and private machine learning is to make sure that there is a better trade off somehow between privacy and the utility. Uh, how you handle, you do not expose the data much, yeah? but still give a lot of utility to all of them, yeah? to all the products that basically are collecting data. Uh, uh, so this is just a, like a correlation between privacy and security. So uh, privacy would be like, how is your data handled? Yeah? It's basically your right with respect to your personal information. And security would be like protection against unauthorized access. Uh, like if there is a somebody is having your data without your proper access, then that's like a security issue. Privacy, even if you give someone your data, that comes with the terms and condition on like okay, this is how you do. Uh, this is what you can do, and this is how much time you can store. Uh, Okay, so there is a, there are two examples. Let's say you have banned data. Ban, somehow you agree to terms and conditions. The terms and conditions are very short nowadays, yeah? At least 50, 70 pages. Uh, once uh, in the terms of condition, you just click on OK, yes. And your bank data is then shared with an ad agency or by the bank. Okay. Uh, then you start receiving uh, messages from that ad agency based on the, that ad agency might be linking with Amazon, Google, or Facebook. Uh, and he sends you multiple requests through your like well, let's say phone or email based on what you let's say I took a loan from my bank, he knows okay, I'm this guy, then he will send me like the insurance stuff. Yeah. So all this data, okay. So my question is like uh, is this like a privacy or a privacy or a security breach? What do you think? Any answers? Gaurav says privacy maybe. Security. Privacy, sir. Okay, some people have privacy, some people secure. Okay. Uh, just to, yes, definitely it's a breach. Uh, yeah. uh, so normally if you agree to a terms and condition, the only problem here is your private data is being shared with other people. So it'd be like a privacy breach. Security breach would be like there's an unauthorized access. Yeah. So like the bank did not share, but like there is a the second one where like the entire bank data is leaked. So there is a like a hacker coming through and then leaking the entire data and putting on on the web. Yeah. So that would be like both privacy and like choose this P I ten yeah who is the person. But that would be like a both privacy and security are breached. Yeah. There is an unauthorized data to your uh, like unauthorized access to your data and your data there is no privacy. Now it's on the web. Everybody knows your passwords. Yeah. So similarly, there is like, uh, so that would be like the versus security thing. So let's look at a small example. Okay. Uh, so let's say there are four persons. So let's say A, B, and C, and D. And there's a question that uh, you want to have chocolate. Yeah. So basically, who had chocolate or not? So let's say A had yes, and then B says no, and then C says yes, and then B says no. Yeah. Uh, let's say this data is up on the internet, like some other data is leaked, and assume like it will cause havoc So somehow leaking chocolate is like a very harmful thing. Assume for this case, it's a very harmful thing. 
Uh, of course, if this is just a dummy data, you can assume that there's a much more that can be much more personal information that can also leak. Uh, but let's say we'll go with the data is leak. Uh, it's of course a problem um, if it is a very sensitive data, okay? uh, maybe about your disease and other stuff. Okay? Uh, so we want to know specifically how many people had chocolate. Okay. Uh, so one of the strategies basically uh, we'll ask the user, uh, okay, user, you give us something that uh, basically that is the YI uh, based on X I is which is the ground truth. Okay. With the probability one, okay. and Y I is like one minus X I with the probability zero. Okay. Uh, what does this do? Can anybody tell me if this table was the actual truth table? If we do with this strategy, what would be the output of the table? If this was the table, okay. and we went with this strategy. Uh, so here, X size are basically had chocolate. Yeah, yes, no, yes, no. Okay. Now, if I use strategy one, so what happens? What happens to the table rows basically? Any... So Three, yes, can, can we uh, add one? We can write uh, yes where it is uh, uh, one, that is probability yes. one that. Okay, so xi and xi, so you can take yes to be 1 and no to be 0, that is fine. And now if I, what do they do? 0.5 in every session. Uh, okay, uh, so let me, okay, so probably, okay, so let me just repeat. So you have a table A, B, C, and D. Okay. Xi are the power, uh, like the actual truth values of add chocolate or no. And say yes, no, yes, no. Assume that these to be yes to be 1 and no to be 0. Now that you have one and zero, I'm saying that the uh, what we do is we convert this table into another table where xi is just replaced with yi with this particular strategy. And I will repeat that whatever it was xi, I will report that with probability of one. And I will not report one minus xi with probability of zero. Okay. So what do you think? What will be the output of this table? This table will get converted into what? Okay, uh, so I'll go ahead. So this table basically says whatever is the output, you just keep it as it is, right? It says xi with a probability of one and one minus xi is with a probability. So you never tell the other thing. So you always tell that okay. Yes will remain as yes, no will remain as no, because we say xi uh, is with probability one. Okay. So yes remains yes, no remains no. Fine. Is, is that understood with everybody? Because it's important to go to the next before we go to the next. Sir. Okay. If there is a no, just type out no. I can repeat again. So everybody understood. Fine. Uh, so now that we have this one, what can we do? If we get the same table as the original table, then you know if we find out how many people have got, how many people had chocolate, we just have to ask, right? We can just do sum on that column. Okay? If we do a sum on that column, we'll find two. So it's perfectly accurate. But is there privacy at all? No. Every row remains as it was, right? We know if somebody gets this data. So A is yes, that means A of course had. C of personal chocolate. Yeah. So I assume that's a very threatening data that we have, yes. But if we got a threat data, then like for example, if I have medical condition, if I have let's say something very peculiar disease, but then I would be like marked as yes on that. Yes. So somebody would know somebody would have access to the data. Yeah. Uh, like security probably I'm not uh, So probably if you can expand the question, I'll be able to reply to that. Okay. Uh, 
so till then, so if you go with this, this strategy, so it's perfectly accurate, of course, but there will be no privacy at all. Okay. Now, if we do this one, okay, so we are saying that you will write Excel with probability of half, and then we'll write one minus Excel with probability of half again. What does this tell? So what will this table be? So strategy two. Any? Yes, Varun. We are. We can be sure of profit accuracy. Yes, but why so? Any guesses? So here, what happens is uh, specifically, so if you see it's, uh, it will be basically a perfectly random, right? It's a, like a, from, it's basically a coin toss, right? We are not asking if, if, because if you see, it does not depend on X, Y at all, yeah? So we are picking a probability like half, uh, like we'll do a flip of a coin and then we'll pick either X, Y or the opposite one. Like either pick a yes or pick no, yeah? With like a, Point us. Like assuming it's a very fair point, there's a 50% chance somebody will be yes and somebody will be no. Yes. So even if this table, particular table, is out there, nobody will be able to tell that A has A has said yes or no. Yeah. A had it in chocolate. Because it's a it's a completely random row, right? That yes or no came from but very random because of this strategy too. So it's absolutely private because you cannot tell because it will be off always like it could have taken, you could not have taken. Yes, which one you don't know. So that's perfectly private. But there'll be absolutely no accuracy. If you do the sum, it will be always half. Well, okay, given it's a very fair point, it will be always half of the total number of people. So you, like, the accuracy is gone. Yes. So, so even if you like, our, all the queries that we make to this database will be gone. Like, will have zero accuracy. So what can we do? So we saw here, so if we have probability one and probability half, and zero and half, basically one comma zero and then half half. One is like perfectly uh, perfect accuracy, but no privacy. The other one is perfectly private with no accuracy. Yes. So what do we do? So what we do is basically we take someone in the middle. Okay? So what you can do is exactly same as strategy two, if you see. Okay. Uh, but we have added something on a parameter gamma. Okay? Uh, we are just adding that to gamma to the XI solution and we are subtracting that from the other part. Okay. And then gamma can lie somewhere between zero and half. Okay. And so this is also otherwise known as randomized response. Okay. So if gamma becomes a zero, then what happens? Then it becomes a perfectly private no accuracy. If gamma becomes half, what happens? It becomes this one, strategy one. So perfectly accurate, no privacy. So what do you think will be a good, what will be the good value of gamma to make sure that it, it's a, like a good trade off? Like what value of gamma should give us like a good trade-off between this one, like perfectly private and perfectly accurate? Any guesses? So we have the values zero, and then the other value is basically half. So we can start with like something like one by four. So that would be somewhere in the half. It's a good trade-off between a, like a pro like a full privacy and then full accuracy. Yeah. So you can take gamma to be one by four. That's uh, that is like the slightly misleading something. Like it depends on what you are doing, of course. Uh, but like over any value between zero and one by two, let's say one by four, could be a, like a good trade-off. Yeah, Priti has a question. And this is otherwise also known as randomness response. So this is uh, used very widely uh, for surveys, basically. Uh, we will see how it goes. Okay, so the way the randomness response works is this way. So we secure each row. Okay? Uh, so what you do is you take a row okay? and then you flip a coin. Okay, if it heads. Okay, so if it comes heads, then you flip a second point here. 
And the second point, if it is yes, then you put as heads. And then no, then you put as tails. Fine. And if it is tails, then you don't change the value. That's against the first flip. Fine. Everybody here is with me for this. So here you are keeping two points. Okay. The first point, if it comes tails, then you do not have to change the value. Whatever is the original value you say. And if it is heads, what you do is you flip another coin. The another coin will basically make sure it is yes and no if it is else. Now, what does this help with? So after this one, we will get basically the data that is 50% real. If you see, if the tails, we do not change the value. So this is the actual value to us. And then the other 50%, as in this is a fair point, let's say, if this one heads and then the flip is the second one, this is like a complete random stuff, right? So what do we have with the data that is 50% real and 50% random? And we would not know which row is real and which row is random. So even if A said yes, So if A said yes, uh, then we still would not know if it came because the it was head and then another flipping point also it was heads, or it was his actual value of okay. yes. So what this one basically gives the idea as well, like a possible deniability. Even if you come back and tell me, okay, no, you said yes, no, like you can also deny like, it, it. It was because of that, or it might have been because of the head also. I can also deny later. So mm -hmm. this gives like this is one of the approaches where you in like basically insert some kind of algorithm in between to secure each of the rows where the data is revolving around 50% real and 50% random. And remember, we still lose some accuracy, of course. Because it's not perfectly accurate. So that gamma basically that decides how much accuracy I will use it. So, okay. And if you want to know how many people had chocolate, you can go through this one. Assuming P be the ground truth of the fraction of the people who had chocolate, the number of yes answers in the new one would be like this. Okay. Uh, the way you come to this equation is basically if you add 1 by 4 here, it will come. Yes. So 1 becomes 3 by 4, the other becomes 1 by 4. That is the total. So P is the fraction. So 1 minus P. Okay. Uh, so this is one of the techniques of randomized response. So you keep a coin and tails if it is this algorithm, or tails it is going to change the value and heads if it heads and tails. So why did we do this? So we had the data. We wanted to know an aggregate statistics, like how many number of people. Yes. But if we share the data set, the problem is our privacy is gone. Yes. Uh, what we do instead is basically we uh, give it a like a noisy data. Okay, so we added some noise or we made the data half real and half random using this coin flip method that is called randomized response, which gives the user a possible deniability. Okay. Uh, this is specifically useful, like if you listen to humanities and all the where they do surveys and lot, this is specifically useful. This is of course we are assuming that the users have said truthfully, yes. Uh, for example, if we go and ask, okay, have you taken a vaccine? Let's say there is a stigma that uh, are you not taking a vaccine is actually a little sick crime. Yeah. Uh, so if you go ahead and ask users, uh, okay, have you taken a vaccine? Uh, users might not be like perfectly true, right? So they might lie also. So this equation might fondle a bit. Yeah. So there will be like an expectation of the thing rather than actual value of how much percentage of users have taken. Okay. Uh, is it fine with everybody? Okay. Go. If there are one, some other questions. Okay. So with that, we come to the uh, basically the definition. Like there's a term called differential privacy. Okay. Uh, so differential privacy basically say uh, there's an equation written. I'll come back to that equation. It's basically say if you take two parallel databases. Yeah. Uh, parallel databases means uh, like uh, almost uh, like all the rows are same except one row. And there is only a difference of one row between those two. Okay. If we take those things and if we 
like have a randomized competition on top of it. Okay. The output of that, the expectation value and output of that, it should lie within the range of the one that has one group missing. Okay. But, uh, so if you read this particular line then, so I'll just come back. Equation, it's fine. Equation basically says, look, if I have a randomized response in uh, on X and an X prime, where X and X prime have only, let's say, one row is missing, let's say, so, then the probability of whatever this output is will lie within the e to the power epsilon factor of the one that does not have that row. Okay. So how does that benefit us? So this is just a formal definition of differential privacy. It does not show any technique how to achieve it. Yeah? So this is the definition. So in this case, as we remove rows, the answer distribution always remains the same with the factor of e to the power epsilon. Yeah. So, for example, if you add an oil data, for example, if we ask a question, how many in, let's say, NYSER and the CUT, let's say, how many are computer science people? Yeah. Uh, so, the answer will come, let's say, 50 okay, in NYSER and then in uh, CUT, let's say, 50 again, or let's say 100. Okay. So, 50 and 100. So, now, if one guy moves from the CUT database to the NYSER, okay, one guy comes here, then what happens? I can ask the same question again. How many are in uh, NYSER and how many are in CT? If CT is losing one, let like CT now becomes 99 and NYSER becomes 51. Even if I do not know that person's data, if I know which person has moved, I can tell that that person is from computer sciences. Yes. So what we do here now, so you add some noise, of course, to the data. For example, how many people are uh, in NYSER, let's say. And you give a randomized response to it. So instead of saying 50, you give a random value, let's say 51. Okay. So it could be like 49, 51, 52, depending on how close you want to be the accuracy. Right? You can tell 100 also, but that would be very far from accuracy. You don't want to do that. So you want to remain somewhere closer. So if I ask how many people are in NYSER in like, uh, uh, computer sciences, so you can tell like 51, any noisy rate. And then next time you ask CT also, CT also will give you noisy answer. So for example, let's say 101 or 102 or 98. If you ask again, without changing in databases, this might give a different answer also. It might give 49 and it might give 90. Okay. So every time you ask, it gives a noisy answer back. Okay. Uh, now if a person has moved from, let's say CT, and we know this is a computer science person, let's say on the background, from here to here. So let's say you ask the question, how many people in Niger have been even if there is a one loss, there is still some noise attached or some error that we are attached to the total value. Let's say the 51 again becomes 51 and the CT becomes 98. That was initially, let's say 98, the original values are not increased to 98 because we're adding some noise. Okay. Because the some noise we added to entire group statistics on each of the data set, there is no, well, there is no feasible way to come back and tell that, okay, this person is this. There will be some amount of suspicion remaining. You can of course have a doubt given on the rise and decrease, but that rise and decrease is a it's a noise, right? It could go up, it could go down. So you don't know. So the increase and decrease might not point you to anything. Yeah. That noise basically shields that individual, even if he moves. We are protecting his data set. Okay. His role is basically getting saved from the individual analysis. So is everybody okay with that? Sentiment. Okay, if there are any questions, just you can drop in the chat. Okay. So now, uh, the smaller the epsilon, of course, the better it will be. For example, if it doesn't matter how many rows you change, it will always be like 50. And of course, like as in uh, utility will be, uh, the privacy will be higher, but then utility will be zero. But if we, for example, if we exactly move back to epsilon becomes zero, then the probability if it says mx is less than or equal to that, uh, then we are actually, if we're 15, the next time will be 51, then we're 52, will be exact the truth value of what the data set is. Okay. Uh, it will have between utility, but the data is leaked, because you can ask the same group queries again and again, and you can leak the data. Uh, for many other formal definitions of differential privacy, I would recommend this particular uh, it's a, like a algorithm partners in French privacy. It's a book uh, by uh, Cynthia Rio. So she is the one who started this term differential privacy and she defined. Okay. 
identity of the world. Uh, so again, just to see that one, so I think you can just uh, take a look. So for example, let's say D2 or neighboring. Neighboring is same as a parallel database that I talked about. If they agree for it, like a single entry, right? uh, except for a single entry. The mechanism is basically if you ask a question on D1, let's say the blue line, and if you ask a question on D2, there'll be all the best thing is a neighboring field, but they'll give you a, like a noisy output. Okay. It'll be very hard to know which output corresponds to which data. Okay. So that's why it's very hard to learn about the individual. Right? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Samisha, you can type your question on this particular slide. Yeah. At least I can get the question. Yeah, at least everybody can like type in their questions. Now I think it's a good time. Till she Okay, okay, I guess it's okay. Okay, Samisha, you can ask your question. Uh, why exponential and all oh, this? Okay, so expo whenever you see it, uh, okay, Mr. Chandravan, so whenever you see the exponential and this uh, log, it's mainly because we, okay, so like of course you can calculate 10 to the power, not an issue, but normally we go, when you go into like the expectation calculations and log expectations, uh, log expectations are calculating very easier because you see, they once you do a log of that one, that just becomes a sum of this here. And exponentially is just used as e to the power. There's no much uh, like uh, very hard uh, behind it. You can of course use one well, of 10 is also fine. It's just natural logarithm. That's the only reason. There is no like a hard bound on why e to the power and why not 10 to the power. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the reason behind uh, Oh, it's how you said multiplying by 10. Is that so? Or 10 to the power? That's right. It's multiplying by 10. Ah, yeah. Okay, so. But 10 to the power is fine. It will not be linear. Not an issue. Huh? 10. Yeah, 10 to the power is not Make an a... issue. It's just if you take really? a rational logarithm on top of it, that will be easier. It's a, but if multiplying by 10, that's a linear thing. Uh, calculating log of those is way uh, like a little bit problematic. But 10 to the power, it's fine. It's just defined as little by exponential. Normally, if they are, it's like a standard of defining your natural log, 10 to the power is not. I don't think it's a bigger issue. Okay. okay. Uh, for this one, this, uh, this one just says that the one that I explained basically, that if you have two data sets, what happens is, and they basically the neighboring data set or the parallel databases, if you have one row missing, uh, what happens is basically, so it behaves uh, like, uh, even if uh, there is a one row missing, they behave basically the around and about same. If you see, this is the probability of response, like a response is let's say 10 or 15, there's a probability that is coming rather than a uh, exact answer, a probability comes. Like, uh, not probability, like a particular response is cut away. Like, the same D1, D2 can give, let's say this value is 50. The D1 and D2 can give 50 for some time also. So it's very harder, like for the same ranges, it's very harder to come by, okay, one person has moved or what is that one person said. There is always some noisy data in each. That's what this slide says. Does that help so much? Uh, so, alternative differential privacy. Uh, uh, so, one is, uh, I okay, so this one is, uh, one of them is like, let's say we allow only uh, group queries. Yeah, well, we do not release the individual data at all to the, right? and we allow only group queries. But group queries are also bad, right? So, we just saw, right? Uh, for example, I, I can ask how many of you are happy about this lecture, yeah? Then I can ask again, how many are happy how many of you are happy in this lecture without some let's say. Then if I get the answer to this question, then I can know if some is actually happy about this lecture or not happy. Right? Uh, 
so there's an issue with group queries also. Uh, then the other point is withholding sensitive information. If we withhold, uh, for example, let's say uh, withholding was uh, information is also uh, like uh, difficult, right? And that is same as asking group query or For example, let's say in this particular thing, uh, I will say, uh, I'll ask the same question. Let's say sensitive information, let's say Samiksha liking this uh, lecture or not is a, like a sensitive information. Uh, so we, I can ask the same question again. So even if she withholds, I can know if she is withholding the impression because I'll ask how many of you are happy without this, uh, without some lecture. And how many are happy about this lecture? So if I see there is no change, I can tell whether it is like zero or the sensitive information is not present. It's, it's, I can have a thing, right? So given everybody has shared, uh, some lecture probably, or I can answer who are liking and who are not liking, two group queries I can find. The other way to do is basically the k anonymity. k anonymity is very popular. Okay, uh, there are, uh, uh, but however, there is a, some issues are there. Uh, it uh, does not work for very high dimensional data uh, because once it is very high dimensional and you want to do k anonymity on top of it, you actually end up masking a lot of values. Yeah. Uh, once you end up with a lot of values, then the point is the utility is gone. Yeah. Uh, then also it is prone to linkage attacks. Uh, but there are a few newer versions of KIMT that actually help against this linkage attacks. Uh, one of the famous ones was the Netflix price uh, problem. Uh, so I think uh, if all of you do not remember, that's a very uh, nice problem. So Netflix, what it did is basically it wanted to uh, uh, like crowdsource the algorithm on uh, like how to re better recommend movies to people. So it, uh, what it does is it k anonymized, uh, so anonymized some of the portions of the resident and then it shared online on the web. Uh, the, the thing had only reviews and then ratings of particular users. Yeah? The user ID was gone, so it was anonymized on that sense. Uh, what people did is basically they linked it with the IMDb dataset. So based on the ratings and based on the location of the person, and what kind of review that wrote with all these three, they basically combined and then found out, okay, which person wrote what review. So they were able to find out from IMDB basically which person wrote what review from the Netflix. So linkage attacks are kind of pretty big. Uh, so it was a very famous problem. Uh, Netflix opened up and then it got affected. So KNMT came into question, but there have been multiple variations to KNMT. That was 2006. Just like already 15 years now. So there's a lot of improvement been done. So KMT is still in picture. Uh, but again, if you're in differential privacy, of course, there would be noise in that data. So it would be very harder to say, sorry, Goro. Uh, I'll just repeat myself. So let's say the noise is there. And then it would be harder to point out if some particular person is missing or not. Yeah. So that is the case. Uh, how much time do I have left? I just wanted to. Sir, till one fifteen. Till one fifteen. Okay. Uh, so we we'll go. I'll share something else. Maybe. You can share my screen. You can see my screen. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so, the, and if you, this is a like there is a course on uh, U, Udacity that is called Secure and Private AI. Okay, you can take a look at that course. That course covers very slowly, slowly on how to build stuff. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go over through a minor rundown. Okay. Uh, this might be a little bit quicker. Okay. Uh, but regardless, I think you would understand what it tries to say. Uh, so this is on torch while so just ex those who do not know a lot of this one it's fine i'll just explain through it so wait a minute okay uh, oh.
give me like one minute. So. Okay, sorry, I thought it was a different environment. Okay, uh, so the initial is important. Okay, uh, number of entries is just so. What we're trying to do is we want to create the dataset that have uh, basically one row missing. Okay. Uh, so this one just creates data set, data set for you. So it's basically five thousand true and false. Okay. Uh, how you create? Well, I will not discuss in the code. Right? But this is a database that has been created with five thousand. All sent through. Yeah, random. Okay. Now we want. Uh, now we what we want is basically this particular code. What it does is it creates parallel databases. It takes one database. That is, this is the five thousand false and trues. Okay. And it tries to create like four thousand nine hundred ninety nine. And we can create like many of them, right? Five thousands of them. Yeah. So uh, those databases are all created basically with. Each removing one of the rows. Let's say this false is gone and rest of them is here. That is one dataset. Now this false is gone and rest of them are here. That is one more dataset. So similarly, it creates a lot of other datasets too. Okay. And one of the examples is this. Yeah. So the database itself, and then uh, for example, let's say our we want to create a like a database of like of five entries. Okay. Then if you print the database, if you see there are five entries here. So it's true, true, false, true, true. So I assume this is like A, B, and C, D that telling if I have true, true, and then false, true. So just a random database of just true and false. Okay. And then parallel databases would be like if you see these are like four in number, yeah. So the total was five, but it's just missing one of the rows. Okay. Uh, it's just missing one of the rows. Similarly, we have created five of them. Fine. It creates all the parallel databases that are available. What you do is like evaluating differential privacy of a particular function. So I just go ahead with this. Okay. So all this code, uh, and all these four. Okay. So this code is available here. Okay. I just see. So you want to run? Uh, so you have it on chat. Uh, you, you guys can also go ahead and run this one if you want to. So if you have a Google Pula, like a Google account, you can just uh, come to this particular website and just open in Google Pula and just open in Google Pula and you can run all of these also. Okay. If you want to run it on your end. Now what does this do? Uh, so this one basically creates a data set of like 5,000. Okay. And we have a function now called a Sum function. Sum function basically does. Let's say I assume two is one and false is one. It calculates a sum on the that particular column. We have only one column, so it calculates a sum. Okay. And we do a query on this one. So query is basically how how many number of people have said true. Let's say we assume and uh, how many number of false. What do you think the sensitivity? Sensitivity basically tells. Uh, like if there is a sum function and there is a parallel database with one data set missing. What will be the sensitivity of the function to that particular database? Okay. The sensitivity de depends, of course, on the data, of course, but this also depends on the function. For example, some function. So I can have 50 trues, and then one true is missing, then can I have 49? So this is sensitivity of one. Or if I remove the row that is false, okay. So if I have a uh, Column and let's say I have 5000 and then remove the true row from it. Then, if I compare that with the new database, that the let's say new DB and old DB, old DB had 5000, new DB has like 4999 with one true row missing. Yeah, then the same like the function sensitivity would be like the maximum distance between this and this that will be a one because the true is missing. The other way it's basically the zero. 
Yeah, because if the false is missing, then this will be also, let's say, the number of true values in the first row are 2500. In the new DB, also it will be 2500 because the number of true rows have not been changed. Yeah. But the maximum distance it can be is 1. Yeah, the sum, if on a binary row, binary column, it always will give you 1 if the row is missing. So the sensitivity is on a particular function also and also on database of course, but it's specifically related to the uh, function. So this calculates, this is a function that calculates sensitivity, but this is like, a, it does the same thing as the previous thing, but it only takes a query as a function. So here query was a, basically the sum. Now what you can do is we can have two query functions. One of the query function is basically the sum. The other one is the mean. Okay. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, mean is basically you sum them up and then divide by total number of rows. Okay. If I want to calculate query of sum and query of mean. If you see, uh, like the sum query, does not, even if you change the data set, it will still be one. If you change the size. But the query of the mean, it, it, it will basically reduce the sensor sensor. You will keep on reducing as you change the data set. Okay. It will start increasing or reducing. Now, if you see, uh, a basic differential attack would be like this. Oh, if it is, I'll explain once I run. Okay. So, let's say uh, I created a database okay, of 100 rows. Then I removed the 10th one. Okay. Now, I will, uh, the 10th one is a false. Okay. Now, what I do is I calculate the sum of the initial database. Fine. Now I calculate the sum of the new database minus the sum of the PDB of the parallel database minus that sum. Now I find tensor 0. If I find tensor 0, what can I tell? I can tell that the row that was removed was specifically false. So that's releasing a private data set that comes from there. So sum can release that information. And similarly, mean will release, but mean will be a little less sensitive to things. There is some removal, uh, but finding the exact thing might be a little bit hard. But it's still, you still get a sum value, like 0 0.0.0.5. So it tells that you have lost each set false, yeah, because there's a one mean that is missing. You'll still be able to find out that it was a yes or a no. Fine. The next one is let's say the local definition privacy. This is the one that we discussed on the randomized response. So what if we add a noise? Fine. So we have a dataset of basically that we created here of 100. Okay. Now what we do? We do a query. This query is basically uh, if you go through this one, this is a little. Uh, so what it says the true result. So here we are taking the mean function instead of sum. Okay. So now the true result and the mean. So we calculate the true result on the initial database that is on the DB. Okay, we calculate the mean. Now we have a coin flip. And this is just a randomized coin flip. So it's based on we're creating a torch sensor or tensor basically uh, of like 100 points. This one basically creates a torch sensor of 100 points. If it is less than 0.5, this is like basically makes it Boolean. So it becomes a yes or no. It's a uniformly distributed. So half become yes and half become no. So it's a fair flip. Okay. And there's another second coin flip. So what we do is the new database will be, we first multiply the whatever we have currently, that's a DB, okay, with the first coin flip. Okay. So if it is 1, then the coin flip, this one stays as it is. So if it was true, it will remain as true. Okay. If it is false, if the first coin flip becomes false, remember if it is like heads, what we do? We ask for 1 minus first coin flip. So now this one becomes one. So but this one becomes zero. So this part becomes zero. This part becomes one. And the answer, the augmented database, only depends on the second coin flip. Fine. Like whatever the, the second coin flip can be true or false. So it will just pick one of the values from it. So this is exactly what the randomized response that we discussed. That's what it does. And then we calculate the on the new database. Okay. And if we run that same query, it's basically on the size, different sizes of data sets. Okay. Uh, so we add this one basically adds some noise to it. So if you see uh, with noise, we have like 0 0.5 with like, sorry, without noise, it was 0.6. So there was some noise added to it. Okay. And similarly, as we keep increasing the data set, if you see the noise gets added, of course. 
But the more the data set is, the noise with noise and without noise, these values get closer and closer. Right? Our, as the values get closer and closer, it's like very harder to determine. So in the for the mean specifically, the more the number of data you have with same noise, because this one adds the same amount of noise. The, the algorithm is same. So it adds the same amount of noise. But the higher data sets, you basically with noise and without noise, if you see the values are around and about the same. But still, with this value, it's still noisy value. And remember, if you give this noisy value output, the next time you run, uh, it'll again be something different. Right? If somebody keeps on querying on data, data, it will still, with the noise, it will still be different. Fine. Uh, is that okay with everybody? Okay. Um, Oh, somebody said please enlarge. Uh, sorry. My bad. I did not see. Uh, but otherwise, you, uh, even through I am going, you can take a look at the code if you have the link or attached. Uh, should I repeat or we can go ahead? Uh, this question is specifically to Chandravan. Can you replay? Okay. So, okay. okay. Uh, so that was the initial just show to how differential privacy and how you can implement differential privacy and how you can give noisy data output. Okay. If somebody asks you, you can give them noisy data based on the randomized response. Okay. You can even alter the data set and give them back. Fine. Okay. So that was the topic on differential privacy. It's specifically done to do what? To make sure your data remains private and specifically to add noise. So even if you share the data set, uh, very hard. Okay. Of course, you would not like to share the data set because still some amount of noise is there and noise depends on randomization, which has to be like proper randomization. Yes? If it depends on something, you could figure it out. Okay. Uh, you know, differential privacy in the world. So, for example, where differential privacy is used, uh, uh, a lot of people are at least claim that they are using differential privacy. Uh, Google claims. Google, uh, for example, uh, Google collects all. For example, if you use Google Chrome, Google collects a lot of data from you. Uh, they say that the uh, uh, all those data are collected through differential privacy. Uh, Rather than so, your data remains noisy and private to you. So that's what they claim. And then uh, there are other places also, like for example, US Census Bureau. So there was a paper in security where from 2018 they said from 2020 all the data sets will be forced to have differential privacy. Uh, Apple is using differential privacy, Microsoft also. Uh, uh, Microsoft also collects all the data from you from the Windows now. So it's a scary company now also. So they are great. They are telling that they collect all the telemetry data privately uh, through differential privacy, of course. Uh, okay. So now coming back, uh, so differential privacy was just a concept to make sure the data remains private and how we can share the data with some noise added so that it protects your particular individual data. Okay. There is some loss in accuracy. Uh, but there is a good trade-off. Okay. You have to decide how much noise you want to add to make it more private or how much less noise you want to make it more accurate. Okay. There is always a trade-off, uh, but you get to decide. Difference in privacy, just uh, like the concept behind that. Okay. So if you do this, uh, that's the definition of privacy you have. Okay. Now let's go back to machine learning. Uh, so that's what we started our topic with. Uh, so now we are here to design like let's say an ML system with sensitive user data. Okay. Uh, so sensitive data is basically anything that must be protected against unauthorized access. Uh, so even if it's unauthorized access, uh, uh, even with authorized access also, we do not want to give it, right? Uh, personally, we would want sensitive data to stay with us. Yeah. Even if the product is really, really good, we might want to avoid uh, like uh, sensitive data also. Uh, okay. 
Now let's take you on the design and ML system. Uh, uh, so normally, what would the idea be? So we can design an app uh, that collects user data. Okay. And we, uh, I think you have seen the uh, Google Apps and Apple Apps. So they ask, okay, uh, location, your uh, user statistics, your uh, purchase history. Uh, when we use it, uh, diagnostics and all these will be collected. Okay, uh, we can collect all those data we want, and then the but uh, but the problem is whatever data we are sharing, the data is personal. Yeah, okay? it's very personal. Uh, so it becomes like a privacy net. We want to build a really good ML system that depends on all those stuff, but the data is personal. So what we do? And of course, we need the data. We discussed a lot. So the Google Map has to need the, your geolocation to make sure the traffic works. Apple needs to know how you sound like so that it can respond to you back. For example, if you stand on the like a road and you sound like okay, Google, it depends on all the phones. That's not right, right? Uh, so it's better if your phone recognizes your voice, how you speak, so it responds to only your okay, Google. So it's very important like that. Uh, so we need the data, of course. Because all, all, if you have done ML uh, in the previous past, whatever, so you know that the performance of the model depends on it. Of course, it depends on other things, but maybe the quality and the quantity of data is where uh, really the model shines. Yeah. If you have a really bad quality data, like for example, let's say you, even in this survey, if some, if everybody lied, yeah, you would have a really bad quality data. Perfect. Like, you would eventually end up with basically wrong predictions, wrong output from the ML model. Yeah. So the quality of data is very essential and the quality is of course, the more the data, the more the pattern is there, that's how it learns. So definitely we need the data. So what is the best source of data? So it's our devices of course. So it's all the phones or the tablets or the computers that we use every day. Uh, that has all the data that we need to build a particular system. Uh, so the goal is then what? So you have the sensitive data that we do not want to share, but we want also a product that uses this data set and then becomes better and provide us really good suggestions back. Yeah. Uh, for example, let's say I am actually looking for a, looking to buy a, let's say, new house. Yeah. I'd actually prefer like, sending me some really good advertisements on, like, on houses there. Yeah. Uh, but the only concern is like my sensitive data, like where I am and all this, should not be shared across all the ad agencies and all the uh, prop property dealers and all that stuff, so that they can use and then have my phone and email and then call me up and then buy this, buy that. Yeah, that I don't need. But like that advertisement coming to me without my sensitive data getting shared, that's that's like lovely case. Yes. So the case is basically what the data never leaves your device. So how do we train our ML model then? If the, the model is a data to train, but the data never leaves the device. So what do we do? So we end up with something called failure to learn. Okay. Uh, so it started uh, around 2016 or 2017 uh, by Google. Okay. The term was basically, uh, that is, the distributed learning would be the previous precursor to this one. Predator learning is a little bit more specific case of this one. Uh, so what it says is basically you train a centralized model. So there is a server, let's say Google sits here. It wants to train a centralized model here, but on a data that is decentralized, a data that does not exist at the center. Yeah. Uh, so there is a very nice comic uh, you can see after this talk. Uh, so the thing learning basically see the data stays on the device and we do not have to, we cannot move the data from the device to any place else. So, but we have to design a very smart way to train our central model. Okay. How do we do it? So we bring the training to the device. So normally what happens is if you see the regular applications in the Google, if you have, so all the data is collected from your phone and it goes to the Google central server. Google like has all the data and then runs the machine learning algorithm on top of that. Maybe it's not Google who is sharing the sensitive data set, uh, but like in case it shares with other people, your privacy is gone. Yeah? Uh, and so she yes. So the idea is to bring like the algorithm or the training to the device yeah? rather than bring data from the user. So the way it uh, 
the basically the algorithm when you say samiksha so the algorithm is basically the model itself yes so the model gets trained initially the model was getting trained at the uh, central server and now it, basically the model is trained at the device uh but the only problem is that the training is resource heavy yeah. uh it needs like a lot of battery it needs a lot of computing power okay yeah? uh Uh, and we know uh, our phones like they do not have like they run on like battery power and the computing power is not good. Uh, computing power okay, so nowadays phones uh, higher end phones might have uh, yes, and then battery of course it's going. On. So what we do is we select the devices that are on charge and are on Wi-Fi and are they are also idle. Yeah, so. What Google does is basically it looks at uh, people, and if your device is on charge and on Wi-Fi and is an idle state, that means there's no usage happening. Uh, it selects your device. Okay. And similarly, for example, at night, let's say in India, from one two p.m. to five p.m., let's say uh, most of the people sleep, uh, so they will find a lot of devices, right, which are on charge and which are on Wi-Fi and on idle. Yeah. And what they do is then. From those eligible devices, you select like a subset of eligible devices. Uh, Monica, the link that I shared has the slides. And uh, so the steps are basically you once you found the eligible devices that are idle, that are uh, on battery, on on charge, and on Wi-Fi. Then you select a subset of them. So every then every device in that receives a training model. Now what do you do? Now because a device already has the data, the model comes with the weights and all that stuff, and it gets trained on the device itself. Because the data on the model is very less. The training time is also very less. Yeah, it uses computing power, but the amount of time it runs is actually very useless. Yeah. And the data itself is very less on each device. Okay. So once the model is trained on your device, the model is sent back to the server, and and the data is kept on the device itself. Now you see the steps. So the model uh, model from the center comes to the device, gets trained, and goes back. Okay. The data remains on the Device itself. The data is not moving to Google, so Google has never seen your data. So Google has only the model that gets trained and comes back. Okay. Uh, now, if you receive a lot of models, okay, uh, one by one from let's say hundred devices, what do you do? So models are basically, if you say, like, let's say, as you mentioned, even like that. So it's a bunch of weights. Yeah. Uh, what you do is you take a average of all the weights. Okay. Yeah. And this is a very uh, Mm. Popular algorithm called Pareto averaging. Uh, it's in you can see in the communication section. Uh, the paper is just there. Okay, you can refer to that paper. So it just averages all the weights, right, uh, across all the uh, devices that you receive. Uh, so it normalizes the increase the weight across all the devices, the basically the new weights that were received. Okay, that's how it updates at the center. So center sends model, device it gets trained, model is sent back. Similarly, there will be hundred models that will come back trained. Across hundred models, it will take average of all the weights and make sure and bring it a final model. Okay, that is the central model that it has. Uh, so then that is we are good, okay? uh, but not exactly. So one of the issues is basically model inversion attacks. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, like some of you have an idea on model inversion attacks. Uh, sorry for spelling mistake here. Uh, so what model inversion attacks is teaching that uh, you can look at the model itself and then you can pass up the data. Okay. Uh, just looking at the model, then you can pass up the data back. Right. Uh, then what do you do? So what you do is you encrypt the model itself. Yeah. Uh, but if you encrypt the model, for example, if you have, uh, for example, if you send an email and you encrypt the email, let's say, the email can be seen by the other person that you receive, right? But then your sender also knows that. 
if the data can be considered from the model, then your center also, if, it, if you send it in an encrypted way, then the data also, like the center can also see what data you have stored in that model. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do? So you do something called a secure aggregation. Yeah. Uh, you can take a look at this one. So this is basically with a key that the, even the server does not have. Okay. So how it happens is basically every device uh, applies secure aggregation protocol. It is a, okay. It's a very simple. So it basically adds a zero sum loss to scramble the training. So for example, let's say you have one weight across 100 devices, or let's say two devices. So let's say uh, that weight is let's say W1. Okay. What do you do? You do a like a plus two and a minus two. Okay. There's a secure aggregation protocol that adds plus two here and a minus two here. Fine. Eventually, when you add both those weights, if you see, when you add those weights here, that plus two and minus two get cancelled because one of them is 52 while the other one is 48. It's uh, W1 minus W1 plus two and W2 minus two. Then eventually when it comes back, and if you add, that addition basically becomes two W1. Or W1 dash plus W2 W1 double dash. Yeah. So it depends what you want. So that is basically the secure aggregation. Yeah. It's a nice way to solve this issue. So here, if, even if your, for example, the final center receives your model, the model itself has a mask on it. There's some noise attached to it. Yeah. Only when he can add all the models together, he will be able to go back to the final this guy, the final sum of the weights. Okay, uh, now this is fine. Uh, now the next is basically what if a model memorizes the data? Okay. So this is a very special case that happens. Uh, everybody's okay with, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll end up in like five minutes, not an issue. And then you can ask your questions from one to 150, I guess. Uh, now the problem number two is what if a model memorizes data? Okay. For example, if you uh, if you have done some amount of machine learning, so what happens is uh, if you if it's a very particular rare data piece, right? As in, if it's a very uh, outlier case or a very rare data, you know, so the what the, the model will try to remember the data because it's a very particular case. It, either it will normalize to this, or because you're sending it to a very particular device and the device has a very rare data, it will try to remember. It. Yeah. Uh, Let's say for uh, all you always tell like Bhuneshwar, Bhuneshwar is my case. So it will try to remember Bhuneshwar itself. It will not try to guess ki, sorry, what is the like more of the city. So it will always guess like, okay, you it will remember that that is the data. So how do you stop? Stopping that comes from differential privacy. So instead of giving the model your actual data set, what you can give, you can give a noisy data set. Back. So differential privacy went back. Uh, uh, so we started in the beginning. So this is to make sure that your sensitive data is shared, but with some noise. So the, even if the model remembers it, it will still remember only the noisy data. So uh, you can take a look at this particular paper also, uh, uh, where even if you have memorized, uh, you add noise to the data, even if the model remembers it, it remembers only noisy data. It cannot come back to you and tell you that this is the what you have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we have the center has the model. Uh, it's trained well right, from across all the devices. We have taken average. And then uh, uh, now we are ready. Now, how do you test if the model is good or bad? So, because there is no data available on the central server, only data is at the user devices. Yeah. Uh, so, how can we test this model? Any guesses? Okay. Uh, so again, so for testing, we need data, but the data is on the devices. So what we do is we send the model again to the devices and test it. Yeah. So if you see this as a plan, this visual, so there's a ball, like a sphere at the center, that is a central server. There are multiple devices across, like as you mentioned, like the star network, okay. uh, multiple devices across with edges. Okay. Uh, 
some of the devices are eligible devices it's and uh, some uh, subset is selected out of them or training and the other subset then you can select another subset out of which there will be like a uh, you can do testing so some devices can be training and then some devices can be for testing right and summary is basically we learn from individual and without learning about any individual at all right uh, so because the individual data is never comes to the same server individual, if you even if you remember the data data it is protected by definition text uh, there are few terms that you probably have to look at is uh, one of them is like predatory learning. So we discuss predatory learning, we discuss differential privacy, uh, secure aggregation. Uh, there are all other stuff that are included that I have not covered. Uh, I'm not like, I'm not the expert in that sense. Uh, so there is one thing called like homomorphic encryption and a secure multi-core. <laughs> There's a specific encryption technique to specifically make the model move from the device to the central server. Right. Uh, I would encourage you, all of you, uh, if you are into this, uh, if you like this field and if you want to come to this particular field, you can take a look at all the four things, artificial privacy, predator learning, homomorphic encryption, and uh, like uh, the secure aggregation through uh, secure multi-party computation. Uh, because anyways, like the secure, the secure aggregation has to be shared across the devices. That has to be done through like a secure manner. So you can take a look at secure multi-party competition. Okay. And this is all the papers we published from our lab. It's not important. Uh, but that's it from my side. So like, thank you all of you for listening. Uh, there's one more thing I wanted to show. Do you have, I have five more minutes, yes, I can use before question answer. Uh, Chandrabhanu, the, the slides are there. If you see, the slides will be, I shared this link with all of you. Uh, the bottom part is the code that we ran, and the slides are here. Uh, okay. Uh, just to make sure that you have a good kickstart on secure and private machine learning. So what you can do is uh, you can take a look at something called PyCircuit. Okay. This is one of the popular libraries. I'm not saying is the popular library. Uh, you can take a look. Uh, uh, um, Santi, uh, I've shared this one on the website link. It is there. And uh, you can uh, go to OpenMind and Python. Okay, this is one of the popular libraries. If you want to contribute, also they're open to contributions. If you can see there are around 362 people who are contributing. There are a lot of people from India also who are contributing to this field. Uh, so it looks like uh, Python. Okay, it's a Python library for secure. So there's a bunch of uh, uh, like this does differential privacy. This does predicted learning and all that stuff. Uh, okay, Monica is asking, okay, so that somebody else has to do, I'm not on WhatsApp, so probably, yeah. Uh, so this is one of the libraries that is used, okay. And this has, uh, uh, you, the installation is there, of course, uh, you have to install. There is one more thing that is called a duet, okay. Uh, I'll just keep, like, I'll just talk about it fairly. So it's here. Uh, so Duet is uh, like a, a peer to peer tool. The way it works is basically uh, there are two things here. One is a data owner, and the other one is the uh, the other scientist or the data user or whatever. And it, and it. Uh, so what it does is basically it creates a peer to peer tool where a data owner has the data together and it gives an access to somebody who requests yeah. uh, the other data scientist or the data researcher what he does is basically requests for to the data owner okay can i like perform some analysis on your data sets so the duet is the server that runs inside the jupyter okay, notebook uh, where the data is hosted yeah. and so the entire data getting hosted what happens is a point the what of the shared is basically the pointers to the data yeah. 
So the other the data scientist, what it sees in that server is the it sees the point like the pointers to the data set. So it never sees the data set, but it can actually perform some aggregate like from analysis on the data. Okay. So do it is the one example where it gives you like a like a research friendly API to do like a federated learning. Okay. Uh, you can host multiple widgets, and then like uh, that can be like a few A B C D people who can post their uh, like uh, they can request to you or you they can run their widget and you can access from each of them the data their, their data sets and then you can pop on federated learning if you want to. If you want to do parent learning and do research, you can take a look at this library. Uh, this is actually this is a basic library that helps you to do so. This is one of the ways. I'm not saying this is the only way to do, it, but this is one of the popular. Uh, so the way this works, I will just show you the beginning, okay? Uh, so that you guys have a head start on this one. Mm. So uh, let's see. So uh, the, uh, this is a okay. So okay, this particular uh, uh, okay. So I just be I'll just show you this one. Okay. Uh, so if you are on this GitHub page, uh, I'm assuming you can see this one. Uh, so the GitHub page, and then you have uh, packages. Okay. In packages, you have the shift. In shift, you have examples. Okay. And here there is a great. And in this tweet, you can choose any of them. Okay. The current example that I'm using is the MNIST one. So MNIST is something that you would you would know. Uh, so we are not going to complete this MNIST study. That takes time. But uh, there's a data owner and a data scientist. The data owner is the one that can post the data, and the data scientist is the one that basically uh, wants to perform analysis on the data. Okay. Uh, so if you go here. Uh, the initial, I ran this one. So initially, what happened? This one is the data set. Uh, this basically downloads the data set and collects it. So I had previously downloaded, so it has a data set now. Uh, that's why it took. Otherwise, it would take time for you to download. Start downloading. Uh, here is the like the import shift and then just launch it. Do it. Okay. So what does do it do? Is basically it opens our server. Okay. Uh, it basically connects to Amazon thing one, but this is. Uh, Oh, the, oh, I can't listen. Am I not audible at all? Like, I'm not sure. Am I audible to someone? Achha. Yes, sir. Okay, just you probably have to reconnect maybe. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Uh, Uh, then once you launch a duet, uh, so what it says is goes to like this is an Amazon initial connect. Don't have to worry. This is something that Open Mind manages, uh, not us. Yeah, of course. It creates a, like a. It tells you that okay, this is the following code. You have to give it to your duet. So okay, so you have to be on someone. You have to give this to like okay, this has to be interpreted. Otherwise, somebody else will have access to it. At least the point is. So this one, you can copy and you can give this to your like the scientist who is there. So here you can come, you can paste, and then. Okay. So here, what it opens? It, okay. Now I ran this one here. But this is just a warning message. This is all encrypted. It's fine. Okay. So what it says is basically now my this server. If you see, this is the data owner server. This is running. It it launched a Duet. Okay. And it has a Duet server ID. Okay. With that, it is giving this ID, and then I put it here. Then on the data scientist person, let's say you are the data scientist, you are trying to perform analysis on this data on a state. So you will give them this code, you will run this one. So he will give you a client ID. This client ID will copy, and then you can paste it the client ID here and then enter. Okay. So then uh, now this guy knows this guy, this guy knows this guy. This is just a key chain. Uh, so this has to be done securely, of course. Uh, somehow whatever like whatever platform you trust on yeah uh, i'm assuming this will connect okay so 
So this one, both of them now have connected. So this one basically becomes like a peer-to-peer -peer connection from this one to this one. Uh, you can also like i would love you all of you to try this across uh, like for example you can you can be in partners uh, at least one of you uh, can host and the other one can be and you can run your duets okay. you can connect this one is peer-to-peer -peer. it does not go through amazon anymore okay. uh, once it is done uh, you can see the requests and you can keep on accepting okay and here uh, here either you can automate the acceptance or you can wait for this guy to auto like accept yeah uh, then uh, here there are a few other codes that are written specifically to for this uh PyShift. okay if you but that's a new library of course i'm not asking everybody to learn on this right there so what essentially it does is basically it creates a model format here okay uh, in this particular model format it what it does basically it trains it remotely that's the only difference it has okay. uh, it will train uh instead of bringing the data set here it will train remotely on the other side okay and then it will just click on back the uh this so there are a few checks for example this model local training requires remote model okay here, okay, so if you go through this MNIST one, uh, what it does, it, it basically downloads the test data from this server. Yeah, that is one thing that it does. But other than this, the model is actually trained on this guy. Okay. The model is, uh, I can show you where the model is. So this is where it is. Yeah. So this is the way where you send. So model is called local model dot send to do it. So to the Duet server that you have, it just whatever the load model that you have, it just sends it there. Okay, that is your model that you approach with. There are few changes to the entire code. Like for example, you have to use Duet dot torch instead of torch. That's the difference. And uh, there is one more somewhere. Uh, thing if I find, I will tell you. But all the things that happen with basically the target. Uh, uh, all things happen with the basically the data pointer. Okay, you do not isolate the data. What you do is you push that model from this side to the data. It gets trained and again comes back. So if you have to try uh, this uh, uh, particular code, yes, credit uh, learning, you can give it a try. Uh, so yes, so I'm pasting the link because some So this is the link for this next one. There are other examples also. You can try others also. You can give them a try. This is on Ferris Learning. Okay. So, secure and Ferris Learning then. Okay, so I hope this is a nice intro to this particular uh, field. Uh, if you want to do more, of course, uh, you are uh, welcome. You can, there's an open uh, mining, is like uh, one of the bigger, open mind is basically one of the bigger uh, collaborations across many scientists and groups. Uh, they're working on this. Uh, so you can collaborate with them also. Uh, so I hope differential privacy, federated learning, secure aggregation, uh, this debate and this shift and uh, parallel databases, neighboring databases, what is the differential attack and all that stuff. Hopefully it was a nice introduction. Uh, any questions now? I, I'm done. I'm done for today. Uh, any questions you please ask. Uh, Gaurav, yes, uh, well, of course, if you're interested, you can always email me. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Chandra. Yeah, uh, this, is a gen this is a generic intro, of course, it takes time to include everything. Uh, but I'm hoping that you understood, like, why security and privacy is essential for ML. Because a lot of data is collected. Uh, okay. I'm assuming there is only thank you coming and there is no uh, questions as such. Uh, any questions, particularly?
हेलो सर हेलो सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर सर व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन बिग एंड बिग डाटा व्हाट इज व्हाट इज द फर्स्ट बिग रिसर्टिंग व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन बिग एंड बिग डाटा बिग एंड बिग डाटा ओके सो दिस इज अ वेरी वेल आई माइट नॉट नो द आंसर बट व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस इन बिग एंड बिग डाटा यस सर थैंक यू फॉर एक्सलेंट से uh one thing which i have just wanted to know since now the personalized healthcare system uh and with the digitization uh like ai based personalized healthcare system um what sort of uh, data security and privacy algorithm would you think uh specifically from the machine learning or uh, ai based applications are concerned for those things mm-hmm. because in personalized healthcare system the data will be usually of the like uh, individual user patient data uh, mm-hmm. and at the same time uh, health system or doctor uh, data everything is very crucial mm-hmm. and security and privacy both the things will be very extremely important so in mm-hmm. that case uh, what do you think for ai based sort of applications which are supporting mm-hmm. this personalized healthcare system or mm-hmm. tele rehabilitation sort of system so mm-hmm. how in case someone is planning or someone thinks as far as the security or challenges are concerned so mm-hmm. what you uh, will suggest in that case okay uh, thank you for the question so uh, health is a very uh, like tip, very like a rare case yes so the point yes. is if you for example let's say consider what we have right now right now what i told you about adding noise to the data set so that makes you private yeah but the problem is health is basically even if you miss like a let's say the whatever the markers like 28.2 if you make it 28.3 does it matter like for an ml system working on a really large group probably not but for you it might matter a lot right for example the city count in the covid case 31 mm-hmm. to 32 you do not have covid and you have covid mm-hmm. that might cause a like a thing so in health care and all that stuff of course like wherever you can for example it's an aggregate statistics that you are looking for uh, for example number of vaccinations we have taken number of mental health issues like all this like number mm. and the sum and the mean these i think you should like all of you should go but like, i don't think currently it's applied for federal learning and the uh, differential privacy don't should go but like mm-hmm. in the personal when it comes to like very you know pin point okay this is the data set that we need to make sure that what you results you have Mm-hmm. the policies are that so yeah. right so, uh, like for example gdpr and all that stuff so where your data stays where it is and then somebody is liable for your data uh, mm-hmm. so i think those are the answer because otherwise if we mess up with those data we might end up with currently i do not have a solution to that particular question unless it's okay. a policy Issue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, but because what I feel, this is what is my mm-hmm. feeling or uh, my observation. Most probably, uh, the personalized healthcare system, it would be difficult uh, to train the model on uh, the test of uh, on tested data, because the data will be purely from the personalized or individual base. So mm-hmm. that is uh, what I feel because this is the upcoming um, trend of personalized healthcare mm-hmm. system with the digitization or AI mm-hmm. application. so mm-hmm. that is why i thought of asking this question because that is somewhere i am not able to get the like information true true so like what if for example let's say how many mental health breakdowns did i have in this week okay. if my psychological uh, medicines depend on how many uh, then uh, it's okay to add you know you do not need to know which day i have right i can uh, add more to okay okay so but if it depends ki only one day if you have and the medicine depends on it then it's a issue Yeah, so it has okay. to be like very typical to what questions you are asking. Mm-hmm. Uh, so every aggregate question that you have, the well, the straightforward, very naive way, that defense of privacy, you go ahead with this. Mm-hmm. But if you, it's very particular thing, like policy. Yeah. So unfortunately, policy is the way to go. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.
Ranjita, I still don't get your question on Big Bang. Somebody... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Big. Yeah, what is Big? Sir, sir, I don't know that. That's why I'm asking you. Everybody else knows what is Big. Because, okay, Big might not be anything. But then Big is just a town, right? It could be... Uh, yes. If somebody can enlighten me if something big is already there, please. Uh, sir, privacy concerns to be added to machine learning. Privacy qualities could be varying. Hence, uh, maybe having a gap. Would be uh, so, like, what have I told you? For the things to work, you need exact data. Yes? Uh, yes sir. If you're okay with some noise, then it's fine. But the people have to be okay with some noise. Because nobody is stopping Amazon right now. No, but there is no law stopping Amazon from collecting your data. There is no law stopping Google from collecting your data. They have no incentives to do this, right? To protect your privacy. Okay. Uh, like there is no fine on them. Uh, there is no GDPR in, in India. Yeah. So similarly, all if the laws and policies are not there, they don't have incentive. I'll collect as much as possible. So we we'll do whatever is possible. We'll they will take the data. Okay. Uh, can I, am, I hope I have those questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I should. Yeah, this is Harishindra Patil. Sir, I would just like to know, as of now, what is the status of Indian research and development in AIML? Is it uh, ongoing or we are still lagging just like other technologies uh, from the international, at the international level? Uh, okay. So, so this would be uh, commenting on all the professors. Yeah. So I, I think we are okay. So there are few areas where we are doing good. Actually, so I think uh, the way to identify is basically if you look at uh, so conferences are not like a, I'm not saying like, like the way to go, but like I think in the last few years we have seen a lot of uh, contributions to like very big conferences like ICML and all that stuff. There have been Indian institutions who have been doing really well. So people are slowly, slowly building. I'm not saying uh, we might not be at the same field as, for example, let's say Google and uh, like a US university. They have like, a, for example, uh, there are algorithms that require a direct access from Google's data. Yeah? So that is something we won't get. So that is difficult. And also like, for example, in fra issues, like uh, I'm assuming a lot of you are very interested in ML, but you might not have your own GPU to run your you know, like a machines. And if the training takes like, so two weeks, then you have lost interest. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure is an issue. It was an issue. Uh, I think in the last five years, I think we have covered a lot. And we are actually, I would, like, my opinion would be we are good. Uh, we can, of course, do better. And we will do better in like, the next two, three, five years. Yes. We will be at the stage where we compete against a lot of people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can an MLB apply to me? Yes, of course. Uh, VLSI theory. Uh, uh, this one is a very typical question to VLSI, but depends on what questions you want to ask. Like normally, VLSI is a, like a very um, uh, pinpointed field, as in uh, it's a deterministic field. So normally, you uh, how do say you avoid putting ML in a like a deterministic area, right? If you have a thing, okay. So if it is zero, one, and zero, the XOR will be one. Yeah? So we know something. Sorry, XOR will be zero. Let's say. Uh, this is a deterministic output. There's no need to apply ML per se. Uh, but areas where, uh, for example, a design, if you're designing a particular chip, uh, you think the ML will handle? Uh, fine, I guess. Uh, but like I think designs are fixed for, for a reason. So anywhere there's a deterministic output already present, ML, I don't think, helps a lot. Uh, then will encryption help in privatization? No. Like encryption stops access, uh, but for example, like for example, WhatsApp, you have to accept those privacy policies, right? Even if it is end to end encrypted, the privacy policy is still accepted unless you like otherwise you won't you aren't able to use. So this is like a forced privacy. Uh, is it like they, they want your access to your data? So it's like a forced thing. Uh, even if it's end to end encrypted, it doesn't matter. Like you have already devoid WhatsApp of like your privacy. So Encryption helps. It comes in public. So, for example, I told you insecure aggregation, all that stuff. Are you on? Yeah. Uh, how to handle noisy data? Uh, I in uh, ML at all. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm assuming Madhuri is asking noisy data in like a 
if it's not a good quality data at all. Uh, if it's up purely noisy, it's very hard. And there are ways to do, ways to handle. Uh, but again, it depends very application specific. ML is very brittle in that sense. Like if you change the application and question a bit, it differs. Uh, there is no direct answer to that. So I'm like, unfortunately, if there is, I don't know. But I don't think there's a direct answer to how to handle a noisy data in a whole. A defensive privacy just goes as it is. If that is the noisy data you're looking for. Uh, any other questions? So did I miss anything? Uh, I'm hoping I answered all those questions. Unless if there is, just sound me like okay or not okay. Mm, okay. Any other question? Uh, will encryption help privatization? Uh, so, okay. So, uh, privacy is like, for example, you can agree to a terms and condition on your sensitive data. Yes. So, that is fine. But if the, if you accept a terms and conditions which is very long and you allowed like bank to share data with ad agency, that's a loss in privacy per se. But you accepted it. But that could have been done better if you did not have to share the sensitive data at all. Yeah. Encryption makes sure there is no unauthorized access. Of course, encryption helps because if the security is broken, your privacy is lost completely. Yeah. Uh, so in that way, it helps. That does it help to the one why? Sure. Of course, of course then you the data has to be secured for it to be private. Yes, of course. Otherwise, everybody knows about it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, looks like there is none. Uh, I like thank you for the like, thank you, entire CP and Dr. Devon also uh, for organizing this one and putting secure and private ML uh, in the first one so that normally it is kept to the last, but is now being kept at the first. So, excellent. So, you'll keep asking every other person the same question. Yeah, so is your data private or not? As you will see, the entire the rest of the sessions will be accessing as much as data as possible to make their algorithms better. Nobody cares about privacy. Yes. So hopefully some people of you will choose this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, make sure that the privacy comes into play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot from my side. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for asking questions. Thank you so much for being alive in an online session. Yes. Thank if you there so are no other questions, sir. I will, yeah. Um, thank you so much uh, for the enlightening and entertaining presentation on this crucial topic. Um, I hope all the participants must have some clear idea about the topic. And um, I think uh, sir has covered almost um, all of the queries we got uh, till now. Um, but still, if anyone is having any doubt regarding this session or the whole um, session uh, today, uh, feel free to um, share them in the chat box. Um, indeed, machine learning is a true asset when it comes to privacy and security. Um, so thank you again, sir, for making us understand this vital topic effortlessly. Um, now, uh, we are having a lunch break. Uh, we'll have a one hour break before we meet each other uh, again on this WebEx platform at 2.30 p.m. Um, also, allow me to inform you all that the topic we are going to cover in the second half is application of AI and ML for visual surveillance. Uh, we surely have another amazing speaker from IIT Bhubaneswar, whom I will introduce to you all right before the session. Um, and regarding the attendance link, uh, let me tell you the attendance link will be shared in the second half. So uh, please stay tuned. Um, also, another request uh, I'll make uh, the sessions link is go, uh, being active right um, at the scheduled time. So please don't join before the time uh, and be on time. Uh, so um, join accordingly. That's all for now. Uh, we'll meet exactly at 2.30. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, somebody has a question. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm still here. If you want to ask the question, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, what value of X-ray image shall be used for Ocha? This is, a, I think, different. I, I don't think it's for me. Yeah. OK, uh, thanks a lot for my time. Bye. Bye all. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you all from coordinator.